we got, uh, seriously, we got nine more talks for you. They're all going to be awesome. They're from recent uh, galvanized data science students who have just graduated. They're, I believe, all looking for a job. And if they're not, you just get to see how awesome they are. Um, there's going to be no questions, but if you do have questions for them, they'll probably be around after, and you could ask them questions. And again, they're all probably looking for jobs. <laughs> so if you're interested in hiring someone with their particular skill set, well, you know where to find them. If not, reach out to me. I can definitely make that introduction, even if you think about them two, three days from now, and you're like, hey, I think I know someone would be great for a job, but I don't know how to get a hold of them. You probably know how to get a hold of me, so do that, and I can put you in contact with them. So, I think we can get started. First one up is Austin Krauss. He's going to give a better introduction than I can to the galvanized students. He's got his own microphone and everything. He's prepared and ready to go. Austin, take it. All right. Thank you. Mic check, mic check. Okay. Well, this one just turned on. You will. No, I'm kidding. But where's the uh, clicker? I don't even know if that's correct. Do we have a clicker? Oh, no, no clicker. My bad. Oh, okay, it's fine. It's fine. We'll work with it. We'll work with it. Don't walk okay. too far away. So, my name's Austin Krauss. I'm one of the students here who's representing Galvanize. And We've been working very hard recently on some data science project that we're very excited to show you. So before that happens, I just want to acknowledge that we've been here for a while and you guys might be thinking about going home. <laughs> or you might be thinking about grabbing another glass of wine. And in case you weren't already thinking about it, even though I know you are, you might be thinking about hiring us. <laughs> but. Before that happens, I just want you to wait, wait a minute and stay with us, because what we're going to say is going to be profound. <laughs> so now I'll get into, into this profound information. So I'll start off. My name is Austin Krauss, and I'm going to present to you Wikipedia Knowledge Graph. So uh, in a past life and in a current life, I was a social entrepreneur. So as a social entrepreneur, I love information. And because I love, love information, I love Wikipedia. So let's look at Wikipedia. If we examine it, we can see that in the English Wikipedia, there's about 29 plus million pages with 122,000 active editors. Now, if we look at those two numbers, they tell a story. And what is that story? It's that it's really hard for an editor to keep track of the quality of all of the articles. So, how do we solve that? The answer is machine learning, and the answer is data science. So for this, I built a model to take in the raw Wikipedia text then predict an article quality score that can then be given to a user so they can make a better decision about how to make Wikipedia more informative. So for this, I got a data set of 30,000 articles. It pretty much consisted of the raw Wikipedia text, as you can see here, and the quality score. So we're gonna jump into these right now. The quality score was something that was given to this by a Wikipedia editor, or by a, a group of editors. So let's digest this. Going back to the text. I put a little bit of green highlight here as a visual aid, so this is the markup. So what I did to understand the text was to create some hand-engineered features. One of these is the length of the article, it's pretty intuitive. The other is the number of difficult words. A difficult word is any word that does not appear in the list of the 3,000 most common English words. You count those, that's a feature. Then also web, book, news, journal citations. Those are just pretty much figured out by comparing the text to Wikipedia's documentation on like what these markups mean. So now let's take a look at the labels. These are, as I mentioned before, the labels that Wikipedia gives to their articles. And this is the definition that Wikipedia actually assigns. So a stub is, provides very little meaningful content, whereas an FA, featured article, just is a definitive source for encyclopedic information. We can just think of these as a dictionary definition and a college textbook. That's intuitive, it's easy, it makes sense. So, what did I do? To predict those edge cases, because you can imagine that it's not a C, it's not a B, it's not a GA or an FA, it's in between. How do we capture that subtlety? Those question marks. Turn this into a continuous feature. So it's pretty much predicting on a scale from zero to five. It allows me to capture, <laughs> cap capture those nuanced subtleties and I think get a, get a better model that makes more sense. So, 
Throughout the process of doing this, I experimented with a recurrent neural network. I experimented with two different random forests. One took the hand engineer features that I mentioned before. The other one took hash vectorized features. I did that as opposed to TF-IDF vectorizers just because it was a little bit uh, better for memory because these documents get long. So I also experimented with ensembling these and trying to see what can I do, can I combine models. I ended up using the random forest with hand engineered features. So now let's talk about this website. I wanted, at the end of the day, someone to be able to use this without understanding, without needing to understand what a random forest is. Just an article quality score. So, this is a website that I built. It starts off, seamless user experience, it's the motto. That's, you could say, one of my core values. So, this is the website. You have, you go on and you first see an article quality score and a little bit of a blurb letting you know what you're looking at. Now you have all these categories. Since we're data scientists, scientists and machine learners, machine learning engineers, we're gonna click that because we're interested in it. Now you go here. You're gonna see all of the subcategories under that category and you're gonna see the category quality score. You can think of that as the average of all the articles under that category. You can sort by different things just to get wherever you're looking to, looking to get faster. We're gonna go to support vector machines. Here's all of the articles under support vector machines and their associated quality score. Now from here, we're gonna click on margin and we're gonna go edit it and make the world a better place. Once again, seamless user experience, intuitive, and it happens within seconds. That was the motto of this. So from here, the next steps, build out categories. As you saw, there weren't as many there as I would like, and I'm sure as any user would like, they wanna find their interest. <laughs> Add article popularity, you can imagine a scenario where you have two articles that are important as an editor, but one of them gets a lot more views around the world, so that one should be focused on before the other one. And then user experience features, just make sure that it's like exactly as we were just speaking with Coffee Meets Bagel, like what can you add to make someone want to come back and to have a better experience on the website? So I'm Austin Krauss, this is my information if you want to contact me. I documented my progress on Trello, so you can see how I arrived at the point that I'm at now and where I'm planning on going. That's on my LinkedIn, and thank you. And without further ado, I give you Michael. All right, thank you all for being here. I'm Michael Palmer, I'm a data scientist with a background in supply chain analytics and marketing. Uh, I wanted to see, are there any data scientists out here? All right, how about people that want to make more money? All right, all right this is for you. Uh, so, we all want to make uh, more money or level up in our careers. Uh, I wanted to help you start looking into that. So I started with just something small. Uh, Seattle data scientists job postings. So to start, I looked at Glassdoor, I scraped uh, all the data scientists job postings, everything that had a salary position. So first thing I looked at was just some basic term frequency. Um, not surprisingly, data was the most common keyword <laughs> in data scientists job postings, so I knew I was on the right track. Uh, a lot of stuff there doesn't really have a lot of actionable meaning. So um, what I did was create a whitelist of data science keywords. So there's like about uh, 300 words. I asked my cohort, hey, give me some data science buzzwords. Let's see what sticks. So SQL and Python led the way along with a bunch of data engineering skills. The next thing I looked at was salary distribution. So not surprisingly, the senior positions are at the top, and you're, you've actually got some research scientists at the bottom in the data analyst bucket, but um, those are like your academic research scientists, your postdocs. So it kind of comes full circle, like the research scientists are the lowest paid and they're also the highest paid. Uh, your, your senior research scientists are the ones at the big tech companies. So I also wanted to deal with some sparse data here. I ran into some issues with that. There's not that many. Um, there's not that much data per, per record. So one thing I looked at doing was bucketing like skills together. So things like Tableau or things like Power BI. Um, I put those in a data visualization bucket. I put things like Java, Python, and programming, machine learning algorithms, I just put in the machine learning bucket. 
So I wanted to see what distinguishes the highest earners from the lowest earners. On these charts here, the salary goes across the x-axis, and the frequency of the terms show up in the job postings on the y-axis. So you can see this like huge downward trend in data visualization. You also see this upward trend in programming and machine learning. And then data engineering is actually really popular in all the job postings. In fact, you see the spike here at the uh, third decile. If you go back here, you see that the most common job title is data engineer for that third decile. So I also wanted to fit some regression models on this and tried several penalized regressions as well as random forests. Saw that rich regression did pretty well and so did uh, the random forest with TF-IDF and these all beat our benchmark uh, guesses. So I ran into several issues with this. Um, data sparsity was a big one. One thing you might see is that um, Tableau is a common keyword or um, Spark is a common keyword. But when you put them together, there's really not that many job postings, not, not much training data. So I could give you like six job postings to make a guess about salary on, but I can't give you a like, high degree of confidence. The other thing is, if you know Tableau, then don't like take it off the list, okay? Don't, <laughs> don't try and forget it. So that's the correlation that's not implied causation. Um, similarly, if you like, learn a new skill, you're not like, that doesn't cause you to get a higher salary. It's definitely gonna help. Um, so next steps, there's a lot I wanna do with this. First, it's a huge issue. I know that recommender systems, um, handle sparse matrices a lot, so I was looking at non-negative matrix factorization. If you have ideas on how to do that, let me know. Um, non-negative regression models can handle things like forgetting how to use Tableau. And then um, just trying to get more data, pull in more data from uh, other studies and markets. Is that okay with that? Um, yeah, if you have questions, reach out to me. That's my info, and I'll hand it over to Chris. <coughs> Thank you so much for that introduction, Michael. Everyone, my name is Chris Bowers. I'm a data scientist with an aerospace engineering background and a penchant for event planning. So at first, you may think this is a reminder for me to be here tonight. I assure you it is not. It is the name and title of my endeavor. Show up the Meetup RSVP predictor. So I don't know how many of you out there enjoy event planning. Personally, I love it. And someone else out there must because we are attending an incredible event here tonight. So I don't know about other event planners, but one thing I find incredibly frustrating is under or over predicting the number of people who are going to attend my events. You know, whether it be I booked too much catering, too large, too small a venue, or I just didn't bring enough supplies. It's frustrating. So that's really the heart of this. The, the aim of my project is to give uh, any event planner a better estimate for this. Uh, you can see over here my web app. All you need is your event name, description, date, time, and visibility. Hit that RSVP My Event button at the bottom, and you get your range of possible attendees there at the even more bottom. So let's test it out. Let's test it out first on asynchronous functions with Thomas Wilbur, exclamation mark. It sounds very exciting. 55 people went, the model predicts 27 to 66. So we're looking in good shape on that one. Let's give it another try. Here we have an evening stroll around Thetis Lake. Sounds enchanting. Matter of fact, seven people were enchanted. And the model predicts two to nine. So once again, we're, we're looking good here. We're looking good here, folks. So let's talk data, let's talk data. I got all of my data from meetup.com's API. It is a fantastic API. If you think you can use it for any of your own projects, I highly recommend it. Uh, I got all of the events that occurred within 100 miles of Seattle within the past three years. And that came out to be about 310,000 events. Uh, my computer wasn't really having that. So. I took a subsample of 155,000 events, used that as my training and testing <laughs> data. So I'd like to discuss my model, but first, 
I just want everyone to note I am trying to find a range that comes into play here in the next slide, for my model is a random forest regressor. And the reason I brought range up earlier is I'm getting that range uh, by using the predictions from each of the trees in the forest. I'm taking the first and third quartiles of those predictions and using those as the range posts. For evaluation, I used mean square log error. The model got a 0.36, sizably better than the baseline of 0.77 if we were to assume that the attendance for each event were the average from the training set. Here we're looking at a histogram of predicted over actual. See a large spike right there, one, yay, that's exactly what we want to see. But a little concerning is this asymmetry you see on your left there. Let's explore that a little bit. So here we have a graph of the predicted over actual on the Y and attendance on the X. And you can see as events have more and more attendance, my model increasingly under predicts for those events. And I think the reason for this is twofold, really. I think one of the reasons is I use mean squared log error as my evaluation metric. And that favors events uh, with fewer attendees. And the second reason you can see here on the histogram of attendance, most events have fewer attendees. Matter of fact, 80% of the data in my test set uh, were contained between zero and 10 attendees. So what we were all waiting to see in this presentation, what does it predict for this meetup? So at the time of getting the prediction, I got uh, 238 people going from meetup.com, and the model says <laughs> two to 59. <laughs> well, only thing I've got to say is uh, this is the largest group of 59 I've ever presented to. <laughs> there is some work to be done here. I'd love to do some more EDA, feature engineering, try to uh, get the model to perform better on events that have larger numbers of attendees. I'd like to get more data. My, my end goal is get data nationally, same kind of time window. And I'm going to need Spark uh, to process that data just due to the volume of data I'll be dealing with at that point. So. There's my contact information. If you have any ideas, thoughts, just curiosity about my project, please do contact me. I love talking about it. Or just talk to me after the presentation. I love that too. There's the uh, website there at the bottom if you would like to exploit yourself. And next up, we have Robert with the weather. <laughs> I will say I've used showup.guru many times uh, since Chris posted it. Uh, my name is Robert, and it's a great, it works really well, so, except for, anyways. Uh, <laughs> my name is Robert Shear. My project uh, called Dressing for the Weather was in partnership with Evergreens. Uh, so Evergreens is a local company. They own a series of uh, restaurants in Seattle, their focus is on salads. And in speaking with them, they had an intuition that uh, sales on sunny days, sales were up at the restaurants, and on rainy days, sales were down. And this unpredictability was a problem for them because it was more expensive to have an understaffed day on a low, understaffed, sorry, more expensive to have too many people working when they had low sales uh, than having not enough people on, um, a high volume day. So they wanted to see if there was a way to use sales to predict uh, the weather. And I said, that sounds exactly like what we all learned to galvanize the last couple months. So um, what I did is that they shared their sales data uh, with me. It was daily data going back from the, uh, to the beginning of 2017. Uh, and then I took METAR data, which is basically the airport, historical airport data. So in this case, we're going field because we're in Seattle. Uh, and I married the two. One of the things to think about was uh, output for the Evergreens team, because hopefully they'll actually use the model in their staffing decisions. So I had to think about what features to include uh, for them. So that was, uh, the reason I mentioned that is like forecasts for the weather are uh, generally expensive if you want to include a widget on your website or um, 
free if you uh, can scrape it. It's also only out five days or ten days, and also not as much, not as detailed information as Mutar. You'll have temperature data. It's going to be cloudy. It's going to be raining. So um, those were features that were included. A day of year factor was created so that a 60 degree, 60 degree day that's sunny in December looks different than a 60 degree day that's sunny in June because they're going to feel different to everyone. Um, day of a week, and then rolling means it is, um, it's a time series question, and I didn't use time series in the models, as you'll see I used, um, so I wanted to include that to make it a time series question, so I used gradient boosting, gradient ground force, linear regression, uh, the gradient boosting performed best, and the REMA model, which is a time series model, uh, because I had these other features, was something, was, was something I didn't include. Um, and then for the error, I use mean square error and uh, mean absolute error and gradient boosting, like I said, performed best. One of the things that, the, the real error would be actually the um, difference from a rolling mean or from their costs from having employees working and that wasn't the information. They shared us the sales information. Um, one of the things, these are kind of buckets that you'll see uh, time series obviously because um, that's going to, time series is like rolling means and averages, so that's gonna be higher. Uh, the weather actually was one of the least important features, which was interesting. Um, the time of the year, the sine and cosine factors was actually important. I have interpretation here because I'm sharing uh, the model with Evergreens, and they are not data scientists. They're biz they have a small business, they're growing in salad people, and so um, a random for explaining a random force is a challenge to people who aren't data scientists. Um, as opposed to like the linear regression, which you say coefficient when it rains is bad. Um, next steps is uh, just integrating the, the model in the, into a prediction, prediction delivery system for them so that they can run the model on their own and use it um, for them. Ceramax is a time series model that includes exogenous factors, so it's something I'm going to be looking at and exploring. And then uh, with the team from uh, Evergreens, they're very they're, they're starting a four ends of data, and so many composition is something they mentioned, which is interesting, so we'll talk about that, and then new location analysis. Again, my name is Robert Shear. Here's all my information, and um, thank you very much. It's working. Okay. Good evening, my name is Jared Anderson and I have a background in business analytics and applied stats. For my capstone with Galvanize, I wanted to take the opportunity to do something that was more um, of a right brain experiment than my previous data-driven projects. So that's how I came up with Crowster, the AI writing aid, and I'm excited to share it with you tonight. The main problem that we're trying to address with this project is creative block and the inability of individuals to create new ideas on their own or to improvise. And that's especially a problem with writer's block, which is the most ubiquitous example, especially in The Shining. So here's how we would come up with a solution to that. Crowster, in its current form, is a website that uses a recurrent neural network that I trained and built to generate a unique writing prompt from a training data set that users of the website can use to either respond to or develop and borrow for their own unique ideas, stories, or monologues. So some interesting and exciting concrete use cases for this are English teachers that want to challenge their students with um, journal assignments they want to come up with on their own, or aspiring young writers that are trying to challenge themselves can use Prowster to put their skills to the test. The data set I used was from Reddit, and it's a collection of user-submitted writing prompts from that website. Okay, anyway, so the data set link is down there below, and I collected this data set and concatenated it into a book of unique prompts that were then fit into my model. My model was, I used, first used a character level recurrent neural network to generate text by character, but that was creating a lot of misspelled words, a lot of pig Latin-esque words, so I then transferred over to a word level model that was faster and creating more interpretable output. So that's what I went with moving forward. The structure of the pipeline is such that I got the data, cleaned it, created my own tokenizer, and then fed, fed sequences of 50 words into a neural network that then created unique prompts. And examples of such are at the bottom of this page here. And I want to be able to, I need permission, I don't know. 
Okay, well, this is a video demonstrating the most recent version of the website that I built today. I wish I could share it with you. Unfortunately, we have, uh, okay. What, can I do anything here? I don't know, uh, we could, uh, Let's try that. Is this going to my five minutes here? Source standard industry wage data for King County from the Employment Security Department. 
In using this data, I assumed that these wages represented that of a full-time Seattle employee. I sourced rental data from Zillow, which provided monthly median rent by zip codes, though unfortunately it was missing a lot of data, particularly in the early years of my investigation. I focused on 2011 through 2017. So to compensate for my missing rental data, I sourced King County property sale records. I focused on condo and residential sales for one to four bedroom units. And in doing this, I had to assume that rental trends mimic sales trends, at least to a certain extent. Proceeding with this project, I assumed that affordable rent meant an individual would make three times or more their, month, their rent in a month. This is backed by personal experience, though, and has been a requirement of every lease I've signed in Seattle in the past decade. To extrapolate the rental data that I was missing, I first smoothed my sale trends. I did this because sale trends are somewhat volatile. They experience recessions and spikes not often seen in rental trends. So I worked with the rolling mean rather than the sale trends directly. I then normalized these values by the sale price associated with the year for the earliest known rent for each zip code. I scaled these values and I interpolated them. I also did some ARIMA forecasting. On your left is a forecast I made for years I didn't know, 2015 to 2017. While my median rent for this zip code did fall within the confidence interval, the confidence interval is very wide. That's because this model is being generated on five data points, which is not very many. On your right is a projection I made for years I didn't know, 2017 through 2019 on the same zip code. Notice that the confidence interval is much smaller because those two extra data points is a lot relatively for this model to work on. For this reason, uh, validation of my forecast was a little bit difficult, but I do believe they capture a general trend of where things could be headed if they keep up as they are. There were a few exceptions where there was no trend to be captured at all uh, and data was everywhere, but that was such a minority in my wages and rent that I proceeded with the model anyway. So now we're getting to the fun part, the visualization of all the work I've done. Uh, I got to build a web app in Brython, which was very fun. Uh, you're welcome to log on to renterslament.online to scope it out for yourself, but we're gonna do a quick demo of the map I've made. All right, so we're looking at educational services, and we'll start out with one bedroom. <coughs> Starts out with some affordable neighborhoods, but by 2016, they have all vanished. So let's go about two bedrooms. Starts out very affordable, um, but as time progresses, we quickly see the affordable neighborhoods diminish. Keep in mind, this is under the assumption someone would be paying half of a two bedroom rent. This is a work in progress, and as I move forward, I would like to consider incremental data for my time series so I can create seasonal ARIMA forecasts. This would include quarterly wage data and monthly rental data rather than the annual data I've been working with. I'd also like for my map to display an affordability gradient rather than a Boolean, is this affordable or is this not, because it'll be far more telling. The last thing I would like to do is aesthetically enhance my website. Uh, it is one of my first and is currently very basic. It needs some purification. So again, my name is Rachel. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. If you have any questions, find me after the presentation. Thank you. I'm a data scientist with a background as a petroleum engineer and nuclear engineer. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a pet project of mine, Fetch, a dog adoption app. Uh, before we get into it, I want to kind of describe the motivation behind this. I was uh, walking my dog at the park one day and a young girl immediately fell in love with my dog, came by, started petting it, hugging it, bonded with it, ran back to her mom and asked if she could get a dog exactly like mine. Uh, the mom responded, of course, honey, as long as we can adopt it. That's when the light bulb went off. How can I help this little girl adopt a dog looking like mine? So I did a little bit more investigation, and what I found, there's actually a moral case behind this too. There are over 1.7 million pets euthanized in the U.S. every year. Um, besides that moral outrage, 
if you quantify that the financial cost of that, it equates to over $1.2 billion, which is basically paid by local taxpayers. So how do we mitigate this or solve this problem? Using just existing mo models, we can do a deep learning image search by just modifying a neural network, extracting features from a user submitted picture and calculating the similarity between vectorized features of that user submitted image to adoptable dots. I utilize BGG16 architecture from Keras, uh, and for my purposes, I dropped the last classification layer, the softmax layer, as well as the fully connected layer right before. What that enabled me to do is pipe in an image of a dog at 224 by 224 pixels and extract a one-dimensional array of 4,096 features, essentially. So the workflow and toolkit, I used most of my data from restedgroups.org. It was about a little over 150,000 images of 45,000 dogs. These are the modules and packages I used. On the back end, a user submitter, submitted image is vectorized and a cosine similarity is calculated. How it arrived at using cosine similarity as a default was based off a user validation survey um, that I submitted out. Well, we had over 380 responses and over 81% preferred the cosine similarity as opposed to Euclidean, Manhattan, or Hamming distance. <laughs> so now, as part of the presentation, we are gonna go over the puppies of puppy. <laughs> So this is Anna's dog. I don't know if she's, yes, here we go. So when you pipe Anna's dog in, this is what comes up. It's definitely focused on the ears. It's definitely got some of the breed down and the coloring. So it did a pretty good job with this cosine similarity. This is Jay's dog. I don't know if Jay's in the house. I will send him these results. But definitely got the color of the dog. Okay. But if you look at the second and fourth, at the top, it looks like very similar breeds, so it's doing a decent job. Don's dog. <laughs> so here, it didn't do quite as well. It got some of the coloring. You get a couple smiling dogs, but you know, with some dogs, it's hit or miss. Now, this is a picture of my dog. Half Pomeranian, half American Eskimo. Let's see how it goes. Wow. There are a lot of American Eskimo and Pomeranians to be a dog. So. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to include this case mainly because Shibas are a very niche case. Uh, most people end up buying Shiba news rather than adopting them, so let's see if there are any to adopt. Apparently not, but you'll notice that the coloring of the Shiba new is very similar to some of the top choices. So it's still doing a pretty good job just with the cosine similarity. Um, also, I wanted to show this is a gradient weighted class activation map. So what this does is really help identify what areas of the picture the neural network is focusing on right before I extract the one-dimensional array. So this is a picture of my dog. You can see it's focused on the ears a bit, but really on that eye. So pretty interesting, colorful. Uh, this is the website template. Testing's in progress. We're gonna have a soft launch on this Friday. So be ready for that. <laughs> So what's next for Fetch? There's definitely some you know, improvements to be made at the feature extraction optimization level. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people at the deep learning, a CL deep learning group, uh, about scale uh, and varying feature transformation from OpenCV. They use that for Google image search as well as uh, driverless cars, so it really speeds up the process rather than just doing this on the back end. Um, also, just some basic PCA and dimensionality reduction can really improve this. Um, adding the pet finder data is another big. Guess we're done. Well, uh, that's all, folks. All right. I can go free salad. I can freestyle right now. I'm inspired by Eminem. <laughs> New album dropped. Hey. <laughs> All right. So besides adding the pet finder data 
to okay to expand the data set. Um, I also want to uh, investigate some performance of some other neural nets, um, MobileNet, ResNet 50, ResNet uh, 100, as well as Inception V3, to see how the performance is in tackling this cosine simulator. learning. Um, also, just collaborating with local MPOs, the Seattle Humane Society, see how we can utilize this to help them. Um, I ran into someone at the King County Animal Control, and they're pretty excited because you could use this to find your lost dog, right? Um, there's a lot of applications. Like for example, if like let's say, you know, at a dating, a very popular dating app wanted to, <laughs> and let's say I'm trying to get over an ex, and I want to get looking girl, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of applications. But, um, So once again, my name is Avi Banerjee, I'm a data scientist, and before we leave, I'd like to let that quote sit in. Thank you. Woo! We have next, Peter, an environmental data scientist. And, um, just to let everybody know, I'm really nervous right now. Um, I mean, so, um, yeah, I'm going to talk for a little bit. Uh, I know a lot more about photosynthesis than I do about computers, so just let you guys know that. Um, so my name is Peter Versions, and I'm an environmental data scientist, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use remote sensing data uh, to predict how healthy plants are going to be in the future. Um, and I use a satellite called MODIS, uh, which is on the thing right now. Um, and it circles the Earth every eight days and takes a picture of every point on this Earth every eight days. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is farmers need to know whether it's best to harvest their plants today, whether to harvest their plants in four days, whether to plants they're harvesting in eight days. And luckily, MODIS goes around every eight days, so I can figure that out. Um, so MODIS is really important because MODIS can see what the human eye can't see. Uh, so mostly it can see different wavelengths of light. Uh, most importantly is the infrared. And what I'm focusing on is the normalized differentiated vegetated index. Um, and that is basically the amount of living greenness in a plant. So here we see two different pictures. Uh, the picture to your left is what we see. Uh, it looks pretty green. Hey, that looks like a pretty healthy farm. Uh, but the uh, picture to the left is what I've taken with a drone image that looks at uh, NDVI. And we can see that the parts where it's super green are the paths between the trees. Um, and the parts that are super green are like the actual trees themselves. And if you're curious, the part in the top left corner is the least healthiest part of that farm. Um, I don't even need this. Um, so uh, the tile that I was focusing on uh, is the southwest of the United States. Um, and it is very important uh, because it encompasses New Mexico, Arizona, South Colorado, and Western Texas. And it is very reliant on the snowpack uh, that falls in the Colorado Rockies. Um, and if climate change is a thing, that's going to be an issue someday. Um, and through a, okay, going back, going back one slide. So uh, the green dots are everywhere where I have a weather station, and the red, a red swath is everywhere where I have an NDVI value. However, there are other tiles that make up this. So the whole point was to make it work for one tile and then scale out. Um, and this is what it looks like using a QGIS query. So I basically just queried all of the weather stations within the swath. And funny thing about satellites is they don't actually travel in a straight line. Uh, so that's kind of why um, there's uh, yellow dots on the bottom side and not yellow dots on the top side, because I drew a straight line. However, they use a sinusoidal projection uh, that 
complicate straight lines. Um, so this is what NDBI looks like on a yearly basis. Uh, so the highs are high and the lows are low. <laughs> And what we can see is that the lows correspond to the winters and the highs correspond to the summers. Um, and uh, the southern, southern, southwestern uh, United States uh, experienced a drought in 2011 and 2012, um, and that is shown up in the chart. So what I did was I got all the weather data uh, and combined it to create like the amount of uh, snow that occurred on one. Sorry, this is where I'm getting nervous again. Um, Good grade here. All right, all right, I'm, I'm gonna do it. Right. So what I did was I averaged the top, I averaged the NDVI for the entire tile, and I averaged the weather data in between each image. So every 16 days was basically the weather that I had for that uh, because I wanted a weather data point to a NDVI data point. Um, and this is kind of how three of my models kind of worked out. Um, so the bottom line, the green linear regression. Simple is always best. Uh, <laughs> uh, like you can throw in your own network at it, but like linear regression kind of just kind of just works. Um, and we can also see gradient boosted and random forest doing funny things. Uh, so what this is is the number of lag days. So it takes the average over the last like. 0, 100, 200, 300, 400, 400 days, um, and adds it to my model, and then sees what it kind of spits out. So I kind of see this graph on like what information my model wants the most out of, like what what can I give it that it really, really, really wants? Um, and we see that the peak uh, mean square, the lowest mean squared error happens at 365 days. So that is taking into account whether it's like a drought year. So like, did it rain a lot less than normal um, on a yearly basis? So that is the insight that I came out of that one. Um, and I think the reason why my model did so well as a linear regression is because it did not overfit my data. Uh, it overpredicted in the drought years um, and it underpredicted in the wet years. Um, but that kind of makes sense is because it's also picking up hurricanes. Uh, so the, this green spike uh, is an extreme rain event, and I think it's attributed to Hurricane Patricia. Um, and that kind of makes sense because it's a linear model. One of the coefficients is precipitation, and if all of a sudden you have three years worth of rain in one day, you're gonna get, you're kinda gonna get a spike in it. Um, so that was just, an, it was interesting to, kind of poke at the models until they kind of tell you something. So that's what that one told me. And the future steps are zoom into a farm level. Uh, satellites are only as important as where you point them. Uh, so I want to utilize finer scale pixel size. Uh, there's a 500 by 500 uh, pixel uh, every 16 days. But the most interesting thing is that there's this new satellite called Sentinel, uh, which has a 300 meter by 300 meter pixel size every four days. Uh, the only problem with doing machine learning on that is that it only just came up, so you wouldn't have that historical um, data. Um, and data sparsity, uh, America is very good at collecting weather data. Uh, that isn't true for every part of the world, uh, most notably the southern tip of South America, uh, basically most of Africa, and also the uh, Tibetan Plateau and Mongolia. There's not a lot of weather data coming out of there. Um, and the biggest limitation is that actual rain can be mistaken as NDVI in satellite pictures. Um, and uh, the biggest thanks to everybody at the Climate Corporation uh, because they were able to really kind of let me figure out what, what I'm doing because <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> Um, and here's my uh, contact information. Um, also, if anybody here likes biking, I'm also looking for like a friend. So like, I guess I'm looking for a job, but like I'm also friendly. So. Uh, <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, I'm the last speaker, don't worry.
So my name is Andrew Nichols, and yeah, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to talk to you about my consumer loan investment strategy simulator. So what is a consumer loan? Let's say I had $10,000 in credit card debt and I was paying 30% interest on that. I can go to this company called Lending Club and they may be willing to give me a $10,000 loan at a 15% interest rate. And then you in the audience or the general public would have the opportunity to fund my loan. And hopefully that would be a win-win for both of us. I would get to pay back my debt at a lower interest rate and you could potentially earn 15% on your investment. So why else would you want to invest in that? Uh, well, consumer loans offer potentially lower volatility as an investment compared to the stock market. And also a lot of people like the fact that it's more personal than just throwing your money into the stock market. So I had some business needs for this case. Uh, I have some friends and family who wanted to invest in these loans. The problem was they would log into Lending Club's website and try and manually buy loans. And there was such a high demand that there'd be no loans available when they logged in. So I wrote some automated investing code through Lending Club's API to programmatically buy their loans every day. The problem is that I let, my, I let them select their own investing strategy, and as a result, they end up picking some pretty bad loans that <laughs> defaulted, and they would end up losing money on those defaulted loans. So I sort of needed like a model to hopefully pick loans with a better return on investment than negative 100%. <laughs> so, I collected my data. Most of the data was provided by Lending Club. They've issued over two million loans. So we have all the information on those, including 37 million payments from those loans. And then I also gathered some supplemental economic data from the Federal Reserve Economic Database. So once I cleaned the data, I started the modeling process. I just split my data into a training and testing set. So for my training set, I analyzed all loans issued before September 2015. And the reason I chose that date is because these are 36 month loans. So all loans issued before September 2015 are guaranteed to have been completed by now. And since they were completed, I could use their historical payment information to accurately calculate the return on investment. So here's just a more specific example of how the training, what the training data looked like. Let's say we were looking at a loan issued in August 2011. The features of the model would be all the information we had on the loan as the data was listed in August 2011. So that includes things like the borrower's annual income, how much debt they have, uh, what state they live in, things like that. And then the label, which is what we're trying to train the model on to predict, is the annualized return on investment. And to do that, we uh, looked at all the, all the payments that came in once the loan was, was issued. So my testing data was simply all loans after, issued after September 2015. I would, I ran a bunch of models, uh, I predicted the return on investment of the testing loans, and then I ran them through a portfolio simulation. So for my portfolio simulation, I wrote a custom class representing an investment portfolio. And what this is, is it allows users to create a portfolio and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna start investing with $20,000, I'm willing to invest $25 per loan, and I require a minimum return on investment of 7%, or whatever. So their portfolio would run on the testing data. It would go month through month. It would check out how much cash they had available. It would buy loans based off the model prediction. And then once loans were purchased, it would keep track of the payments that were coming in. And it would update the portfolio's cash balance accordingly. And also keep track of loans that had defaulted. So I tested this with a, I ran simulations with a variety of models. I started with two naive strategies. And the first was just if the user only wanted to buy like the highest interest rate loans because they were greedy. Uh, and the second was if the user wanted to buy the lowest interest rate loans, cause, loans because they thought they were safer. And then I also did a decision tree, a random forest with 10 and 100 trees and an XG boost model. And here you can see the performance of a simulated portfolio that's a $20,000 investment, investing $25 per loan. And uh, it turns out selecting the highest interest rate loans actually performed the worst, whereas the XG boost model performed the best. So this is just sort of quantifying the results. Uh, this is the annualized return on investment of the different models. The high interest rate strategy was the only model that was negative, whereas the XG boost <laughs> model returned about 9% uh, annualized each year. 
So my next steps are to talk to my clients. I call them my clients, but it's just my parents and three friends. Uh, I need to make sure they're happy, and if they are, I need to integrate this model with my automated investing code. And how I will do that is I will host the XG Boost model as an API that can be called from the automated investing code to make a prediction on new loans that come in, and then I will continue model training because there's more improvement to be found there. Tonight, that was nine people in a row, which is crazy. That's the most crap he's ever done. So, props to all of you for being involved in that. Holy crap. Also, I timed all of you, and you were all on time. Even uh, you with the projector problems, uh, you were on time, including that time. So, mad respect, honestly, because I would have. I probably would have. Yeah, I would have been so distracted that I probably would have gone 10 minutes over. So, uh, uh, mad respect. So, uh, we're done for tonight. That is the rest of a uh, uh, puppy. However, I mean, I guess I say we're done, but uh, we do have an after party we normally do, and today it's very conveniently downstairs. So just take the elevator, go downstairs, and you're going to the lobby, and you're going to hang a left, there's a bar, go there. That's the, the puppy after party tonight. It's not an open bar, and you've got to you know, pay your own way. Uh, hopefully you're all good with that. Uh, if someone wanted to buy me a beer, I'd totally be okay with that. Uh, <laughs> But I'm not requiring that, of course. <laughs> Thank you for coming out. Uh, stay safe. Uh, head home. If you're going to head home, that's great. That's fine. Uh, hang out if you're going to hang out. Uh, and hopefully you'll be back uh, next month. Thank you for coming out.